Om Jnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gaurave Namaha Vanchakalpata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasa Digor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We welcome all, all the devotees to our, our second lesson, uh, second session on Bhakti Shastri, Overview of Bhagavad Gita. We're on Chapter 7. Review, Lesson 1. So, Lesson 1, yesterday we spoke about Krishna, knowing Krishna in full by hearing about him. That was the very first verse, right? The first three verses actually emphasized the importance of hearing. Well, the third verse was more about people who don't hear, the rarity of people who actually hear. And then we heard about Krishna's energies and his position in relation to his energies. Krishna's energies, his prakriti, para prakriti and apara prakriti. And we heard also about Krishna, knowing Krishna through his impersonal feature. <coughs> Maybe someone can give me an example. How do we learn about Krishna through his impersonal feature? Maharaj, like uh, yesterday uh, we were reading that Krishna is the taste of waters or, or the uh, like the light that we see from coming from sun and moon. Mm -hmm. So like this we can see that Krishna is there. Yes. And he's the ability of man, intelligence of the intelligent. Yes, good. Thank you, Prabhu. And then we went on to hear about how the three modes are controlled by Krishna. Because of the three modes, that's why we don't know Krishna. <laughs> what we need to do is to surrender to Krishna. And by surrendering to Krishna, we can cross over the modes of nature. All right, so we're going to go on today to hear chapters Fifth, uh, chapter 7, verses 15 up to 28. Right? So we hear about the, the four kinds of impious persons who don't surrender and the four kinds of people who do surrender, who are pious. So that will be interesting. Then we're going to hear about demigod worshippers. It's always interesting for people from India. There's a lot of demigod worship goes on. And we'll also hear about impersonalism. So these two things are very prominent everywhere in the world. Impersonalism and demigod worship. All right. And then we will also hear Punya Karma as a prerequisite for practice of Krishna Bhakti. Punya Karma. That's text 28. All right, so we're going to begin to hear about, first of all, the four kinds of people who don't surrender to Krishna. Right? Uh, sometimes Prabhupada would say that, you know, people may accuse Krishna. Oh, this Krishna, you know, they say thing, not some things, they would deride Krishna, they would speak some ba bad words about Krishna some nasty remarks about Krishna. But Prabhupada said Krishna has something to say about these kind of people. And this is here in verse number 15. Krishna explains the nature of these people who were against Krishna. So they're put into four categories. Would someone please read the verse? Namam dasmitam amura prapadante naradhama 
माया अपहृत ज्ञान आसुर भाव आश्रिता Go ahead. Those miscreants who are grossly foolish, who are lowest among mankind, whose knowledge is stolen by illusion, and who partake of the atheistic nature of demons, do not surrender unto me. All right. So our Krishna is describing these four kinds of people. They're they're not pious. They're duskriti, duskritinas. They have no pious activities. So because they're not pious, they have these different uh, reasons for not surrendering to Krishna. We're going to hear the, how the Acharyas describe these people. We can see the four kinds of people. There's the mudha, meaning the grossly foolish person. Donkeys are foolish creatures. And then there's the Naradama, meaning the lowest among mankind. The Maya Aparita Jnana, one whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. And then finally the Asuram Bhavam Ashrita, those who partake of the atheistic nature of demons. They may be... Uh, blasphemers, they may be atheistic, but they're asuras, meaning demons, <laughs> right? They're described as demon, demonic mentality, and they don't surrender to Krishna. So these are the four categories of people who don't surrender. Mentioned here, first of all, mudha, someone read? This is Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur describing. Yes, Maharaj go ahead, read. Oh my God. They're just like animals who work very hard day and night to clear the burden of self-created duties. They have no time to hear of spiritual topics, but instead listen to mundane narrations, just like the swine who prefers to eat stool than sweet meats. Yes. Read the rest. Okay. So, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is describing these people, the mudhas. If no time, why? Oh, I have to work. I have so many things. I have to work. Why you have to work? Oh, I have to eat. I have a family to support. I have to feed my family. So, <laughs> Prabhupada, uh, Lord Krishna compares these people to foolish creatures like the donkey. The donkey is foolish because the donkey carries a heavy load to eat grass. But grass is growing everywhere. But the donkey thinks if I don't carry the heavy load, I won't get any grass to eat. But grass is growing everywhere. And so similarly these people are described, uh, they won't listen to narrations of the Lord. They're, they're like pigs who like to eat stew rather than sweets. Prabhupada used to say, if you offer the hog some nice halava cooked in ghee, the hog will say, no, no, no thank you, just give me some stew. So. Muthas are similar pe people like that. Yes? Go ahead, Maharaji, keep reading. Bhakti Vinod, those are atheistic persons who follow moral principles without taking shelter of me, the presiding deity of morality. And then? Naradamas, the civilized form of human life is meant for reviving Krishna consciousness. Whoever loses this chance is classified as a Naradha, Naradhama. Socially and politically developed, but have no religious principles. They neglect prime duty of human being. SPP. We see. Even after performing bhakti for some time and attaining the qualities of a human being, they finally give up the process of bhakti willfully, thinking that it is not effective in attaining the desired fruit. Such persons are nardhamas. Yeah, sometimes we describe, uh, some of the, the acharyas will describe the naradhamas 
as people who are born in good families, maybe Brahmana families, they have a, a good cultured birth, but somehow just due to uh, poor association, they become very influenced by the age of Kali and they develop all bad habits and they lose their chance. Although they're born in pious religious families with a good caste, they, they don't take the opportunity. Instead, they just simply dedicate their life for economic development and to be comfortable in the material world. So, these people are compared like Nara Dhammas. They don't have any concern about the real duty of human life. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur describes a little different. He talks about people who come to Krishna consciousness for some time. They take up bhakti for some time, but they give up the process, thinking, they think, well, it's not working, it's, I'm not, it's not working for, it's not helping me. And so these people are naradamas, the lowest of people. They come into Krishna consciousness, they give up, they go away. Why? Because they're weak. They just say, oh, it's not working. It worked for so many people in the past, but they say, no, it's not working for me. I'm not, it's not happening. That's their excuse. It's their excuse to just go back into the world of samsara and to take up all their sensual activities again. Okay, someone else read? Naradhamas, Bhakti Vinod, the lowest of human beings are those who consider me to be only an aspect of morality, but not the lord of morality. Mm. Maya, pa Maya Partha Jnana, they are mostly very learned fellows, great philosophers, poets, scientists, etc. But the illusory energy misguides them and therefore they disobey the Supreme Lord. They deride the personality of the Supreme Lord and consider him merely another human being. Vishwanath Chattavarti Thakur. Their knowledge has been stolen by Maya. Even after studying Shastra, they think that only the form of Narayan, situated in Vaikuntha, can be served eternally and can grant eternal bhakti. One cannot perform bhakti eternally to other forms such as Ram and Krishna, because they are human-like. In Bhagavad Gita 9.11, Lord says, Fools deride me even when I appear in my human form. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so Maya Aparita Jnana, people whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. And they're described here, they're often very learned fellows, academically learned, they may be philosophers, poets, scientists, etc. But they, they, they try to understand the, the, the scriptures, they try to understand spiritual knowledge without the help of the acharyas. They don't follow the parampara. Rather, they simply use their own mind and their limited material intelligence to explain the personality behind the universe. So they deride the personality, so often they deride the personality of the Lord. In other words, they consider him to be, imper they consider the Lord of creation to be impersonal, and if, when Krishna comes, they consider him to be an ordinary human being, and they think ultimately the Brahman is the Supreme. Although in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has said, Brahmano hi pratistaham, that he is the basis of the impersonal Brahman, they turn it the other way around. They say the Brahman is the basis of Krishna. So this is Maya Aparita Jnana. Armchair philosophers, they're thinking they know everything of the Vedas and they just try to understand it all with their misguided, misdirected intelligence. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 
Maya Parata Vyana, Bhakti Vinod. They do not know my omnipotent nature, the eternal conscious nature of the jiva, the temporary nature of the relationship of the jiva with inert matter, or the eternal nature of the relationship of the jiva with me as my servant. Asuras. Those who have taken shelter of demonic nature, asuram bhavam ashitaha, this class is openly atheistic. They attack the personality of the Godhead with the bad logic, thus trying to destroy him, his personal form with their arguments. They argue that the Supreme Lord can never descend upon this material world. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, Asuras such as Jarasan shoot arrows in order to hurt my transcendental body. Those who carry Asuric Bhava use illogical reasoning to deny my Shri Vikraha, which is eternally situated in Vaikuntha. They do not surrender unto me. So the Asuras, the demon, demonic nature, openly atheistic, deny the personality of Godhead. They say, oh, to the, they, they say the Lord would never come to this world. If there is a Supreme Lord, he would never come to this world. And the Vishwanath Chakrabhati Thakur gives examples of such demons. Jara Sanda. Now, Jarasandha is an interesting example because Jarasandha had a lot of faith in the Vedas and he was giving charity to Brahmanas. He had, he had that custom. He liked to give charity to Brahmanas because he understood that by giving charity to the Brahmanas, he would get a lot in return. So that was why Lord Krishna had come with, along with Bhima and Arjuna to beg charity from Jarasandha. Maharaj Yudhisthira wanted to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice and they had to have, they have to have uh, all, the, all the kings in, in the world had to be subordinate to Maharaj Yudhisthira. So they had to come to Jarasandha and beg a fight. They knew Jarasandha would never accept the position of Maharaj Yudhisthira as supreme. So they had to come and challenge him to fight. And Jarasandha, being so charitable, he saw them, he saw Bhima and Arjuna and Krishna together, dressed as Brahmanas, and he could understand they couldn't be Brahmanas because they were so well built and they had voices like thunder. <laughs> so he thought, what kind of Brahmanas are these? But anyway, he gave charity to them and he ended up fighting with Bhima. And it was Bhima, of course, who ended the life of Jarasandha. Anyway, there are many modern-day asuras, modern-day asuras, people who are against the supremacy of the Lord, and they're against the worship of the Lord, and they use uh, all kinds of uh, methods to try to suppress the preaching of the mission of the message of the Lord. In the modern society, there's so much atheism, it's all over the planet. Particularly if you go to communist countries, there are still five communist countries on the planet. And they, of course, they have intensive propaganda against religion. And they will say that religion is the opium of the people. This is, of course, coming from Karl Marx. Karl Marx, he, he was a German, and he wrote his book about communist philosophy. And he condemned religion, he condemned the blind following of religious faith. So, big atheists. Even in modern universities today, you will find they have atheistic societies. They have the, the atheist society. Some devotees I know in the University of Canberra, they told me how, uh, that's an Australian National University, they told me they, they would have a program for Krishna consciousness, and just as they finish, the atheist society will come and take over their room. And the atheist people, they come and they, they're very mocking and 
very nasty towards the devotees. All right, so in the modern world, we do see a lot of uh, these different people. The mudhas, of course, in predominance, a lot of mudhas, people just want to work hard just to get money. They're thinking that will satisfy all the problems of life. And then naradamas are also there. People with the good birth who don't take advantage, people who had the opportunity for Krishna consciousness, but gave it up. And then the Maya Aparita Jnana, the speculative philosophers and the Jnanis, like Vedanta society, you know. Uh, you go in, if you go to uh, somewhere like University of California in Berkeley, they have a Vedanta society and they sit in armchairs and they discuss the Vedas. And people also, if you go to South India, Auroville, you know, people discuss the writings of Aurobindo and <laughs> like, the, you know, all speculative philosophers try to understand things by their own mind. And then the Asuras also, not a small number of Asuras, people who don't believe in God. All right? So we ask you, how does Lord Nityananda's mood of delivering Naradamas reflect Srila Prabhupada's mood? Of course, you all Hare know. Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, this is so this is this is very easy to answer. And Lord Nityananda delivered Jagai and Madhai, though they uh, 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 same like uh, Stupad, he went to West where people were like drunk and all, they were all not following him, no rules, they were even not aware about any principles, nothing. That was their culture and uh, Prabhupada went there, is one just like a nasty place, like a hell. Prabhupada in the, in the Jaladut also, Prabhupada said, when he reached America, Prabhupada said that, Oh Krishna, where have you brought me uh, like this? So he delivered them. So same would shown. Well, you know, I would argue, Nityananda, Lord Nityananda, he delivered Naradamas. You give the example of Jagai and Madai, but Jagai and Madai, yeah, they were born in a Brahmana family and they had become degraded. But, you know, Prabhupada was taking people who were much lower than Naradamas. Pa Prabhupada's mood, people who were all Yavanas and Chandalas, you know, were all born outside the Vedic culture. Lord Nityananda delivered this Jagai and Madai, they were at least born in the Vedic culture. But Prabhupada went outside the Vedic culture, across the ocean, you know, so there's quite a difference there, really. Maharaj, uh, I heard one of the like in the one of the lecture of Srila Prabhupada disciple Her Grace Devi Shakti Madhavi, she was telling do you all should know that Srila Prabhupada disciples are not an ordinary person. As Srila Prabhupada has sent by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's a Shaktya Veshaktar. So uh, they all are. Yes, I am uh, uh, understanding, I am agreeing that yes, they have taken birth there. But they are not ordinary, like Guru. When we say the Guru is a gu whole Guru Parampara, they are coming the Parampara and that Guru which I have chosen or the whole Gurus are in Scorn, they are not for this birth only. So they are from all life, eternity, till eternity they will be like. So they are not an ordinary people. Well, Jagai and Madai were also not ordinary people. They became great devotees. Yes. You know, yes, they, yes, Maharaj. They're there in the tree of Lord Nityananda, right? Yes. And uh, I, I think one similarity, Lord Nityananda was attacked and he, he was violently attacked. 
that he was hit with the wine pot and it drew blood from his head. And similarly, Prabhupada would sometimes be uh, attacked, you know, the, like sometimes Prabhupada had to live with young men who were drug addicts or he was just living with people who were not devotees at all, people who were keeping even meat in their refrigerator. Prabhupada was had to live with them. In the beginning, Prabhupada tolerated these kind of things. Lord Nijananda didn't have to tolerate those kind of things. Okay. Much later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just one more. Like, uh, Nityan Prabhu also didn't saw shortcomings of anyone. Like, Jagai Madai, he didn't saw, see the shortcomings. Similarly, Srila Prabhupada also didn't see the shortcomings the Westerners were having. He always uh, saw the bright thing that they, they want to, they have some quality and they want to engage in service. Like, how uh, Jagai stopped Madai. So, he was, uh, so Nityan Prabhu also glorified him that he was the one who saved me. So he just saw this past spark uh, which was there in some, some, of something good. Okay, that's a very nice point, Prabhu. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Nityananda uh, Prabhu's mood of engaging people, similar to Prabhupada's mood. I just a uh, small point I want to say here. Like Nityananda Prabhu's mood was uh, one of the mood of Nityananda Prabhu was like he was he used to go door to door and knock them and request them to please take the name of Krishna or please chant the holy name. Similarly, Prabhupada not only knocked different doors but went to different countries and requested them to please take this holy name of the Lord. Okay, yes. Prabhupada knocked on the doors of different countries. Lord Nityananda was going door to door, falling at their feet, begging them. In the same way, Srila Prabhupada also humbly requested everyone to take up Krishna consciousness. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and we're going to hear about the four kinds of pious men who do surrender to Krishna. So they all these four kinds of people, they have some sukriti. Un unlike the people who don't surrender, these people have sukriti. They've, somehow they have that piety which brings them to Krishna consciousness. And so there are also, just as there were four people who did not surrender, there are four kinds of people who do surrender and they're listed as the distressed, the desire of wealth, the inquisitive, and he who is searching for knowledge of the Absolute, right? So, Chatur Vida Bhajanti Mam Jnana Sukriti No Arjuna Arto Jignasur Arta Arti Jnani Cha Bharata Arshaba So Arta, those who are in distress and then Jignasu, the inquisitive and then Arta Arti, the desire of wealth and the Jnani, the one who has knowledge. So they're all good people, they've taken devotional service, they've taken up devotional service. All right, someone would please read for us. Artha is a pious person who turns to Krishna out of distress. Gajendra is an example. Do you get many people coming in distress to Krishna consciousness? Is it very common? in? your place, that people are in distress? Maharaj? Yes, Maharaj. Are people often in distress there? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, I think so. Prabhupada saw in America, he saw in the USA that so much distress, so many people were in distress, he was surprised. Prabhupada thought there would be no distress there, but he saw much more distress than he saw in India. The people are, the more there is material opulence, the more there is distress. It's a fact that the material opulence doesn't make people happier. It makes people more miserable, more, more in distress. 
we were, we were, I was traveling in Bengal to some places and one village I was staying, I was, uh, it was arranged I was staying in someone's home. So the gentleman told me, he said, his son committed suicide. And the reason why he committed suicide, he said, because he said, my father doesn't have any money. So my life is useless, so I'm going to com <laughs> commit suicide. That was just one example. I'm surprised that, so, that there's so many suicides here in India. And for, the, for what reason? Often these reasons, no money, oh, I have no money, I'm poor. <laughs> they, they do not understand the happiest people in the world are the people who are poor. Rich people are not happy. Rich people are more in distress, more in anxiety. So people have desires, they have distress. An the example there is Gajendra. Yeah, of course you know that. Yeah. So then the next example, Jignasu. One who, yet one who inquisitively approaches Krishna to understand the soul or to become acquainted with scriptural knowledge, Sanskrit grammar, etc. Shonakarishi is an example. Shonakarishi is the head of the sages in the Naimasharanya forest, by the way. So Shonakarishi, he was putting the questions to Sutta Goswami. He was very inquisitive and he was eager to hear about Krishna. And he was, uh, by his wonderful questions, he was able to bring out the speaking of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Jignasu is a, a nice quality, a good quality to have. One wants to understand the soul, or we want to become more acquainted with things like scriptural knowledge or Sanskrit grammar. Just recently that I met this one Russian lady, she started to learn Sanskrit on her own. Somehow she became attracted to Sanskrit and then she ended up getting some books and she became a devotee. And now she stays here in Mayapur. <laughs> and it came about because she had an interest in Sanskrit. Hmm. All right, and then... I had one question. Yes, yes. Apparently, uh, uh, here uh, the example is given of Shonak Rishi. So, uh, I heard somewhere that uh, Shonak Adi Rishis were more attached to Karmakand. Like they were not uh, very much uh, inclined towards pure devotional service, but they were more into karm kant. That is why in many of the chapters of Bhagavatam, uh, it is given that whoever hears it, this with faith doesn't has to pay, uh, face any distress in his life or there will be no shortage of wealth like this. So that, that is why these kind of shruti pals are given. Uh, and because these Shonakati rishis uh, were attached to karm kant. So is it true? Well, Generally, the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, these kind of examples are given that by hearing this you'll get, you know, free of anxiety and you'll have no problems for wealth and so on like that. These are given like as incentives to new people to encourage them to hear. But Shonakarishi, we can understand, I, at least I, when I hear what Sonakarishi is saying in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's so powerful, it's, you know, it's so wonderful, it really is inspiring to hear him speak. And because he's there asking these questions, you know, he is the, the real impetus behind the speaking of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Sutta Goswami is able to respond to the questions of Sonakarishi. So, you know, I've never heard before anywhere that he's a karma kandhi or anything. <laughs> I certainly don't see him that way. And as you go through Srimad Bhagavatam, you hear him speaking. Just like if you read the second canto, you can read there about how Shona Karishi describes so nicely, you know, the, the different 
features of the material world, people who don't engage in devotional service, you know, people who don't go to see the deity, their eyes are like the eyes on the plumes of a peacock, and people who don't use their head to bow before the Lord, it's just like a head which is a heavy burden. And if you don't use your ears to hear, then your ears are like the holes of a snake, and your tongue is like the tongue of a frog, croaking of a frog. And this way, Sonika Rishi, I mean, he's so powerful the way he speaks. Uh, it's really wonderful to, you know, I, I cannot see how he's a, how you could think of him as being Karma Kandi. I don't think of him that way anyway. Although he may, sometimes, some of these devotees, they may present themselves in that way just for the sake of the common people. They don't want people to actually know their real heart because they, their bhakti is confidential. They keep it more confidential. They don't show it to everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, then next time, Arta Arti, someone please read. Artha Arthi is one who wants to enjoy land, money, sons, or a wife in this life or the next. Fortunately, he asks Krishna, not the demigods, to supply his needs. Dhruva Maharaj is an example. Mm, yeah. So, people in need, we have maybe economic problem. Sometimes we get devotees, you know, they have no job. They come to Krishna consciousness, they get a job working for Krishna. So it's good they come to Krishna, they ask Krishna, they don't go to the demigods to supply their needs. That's because of their piety. That's good. I thought Dhruva Maharaj is the example. The devotees in the three categories above are Sakama Bhaktas. More specifically, they are Karma Mishra Bhaktas. Because they ask, they ask Krishna to fulfill their fruit of desires. Right? Artha, Jignasu and Artharti. They all have some kind of desire, something they want. Someone's in distress, I want to get free of my distress, my problem, I have a big problem, I'm in distress, help me, help me. And Jignasu, someone's also desiring to know, he wants to, un what is this about? Tell me more, I want to understand it. And Art Arti, oh, please help me, give me, help me get money, help me get my uh, daughter married, help me get a new home, oh, so, so many things. So they ask Krishna to fulfill their desires. So they're all. They're all devotees, but they have material desires. So they're described as Sakama Bhaktas. Not Shuddha Bhaktas, but Sakama Bhaktas. Devotees with material desires. So there was one more category which we didn't hear yet. Someone can read? Fourth category. Fourth category. Yes. Fourth category, Agyani. Nishkam Bhakta, technically referred to as Jnana Mishra Bhakta or Yoga Mishra, he, he approaches Krishna not to have his material desires fulfilled but to gain knowledge and thus approach liberation. Therefore, he is on the Nishkama platform. All right, so he's above these people. This Jnani is above these people. Why? Because he doesn't have any material desires. He doesn't come to Krishna to get his material desires fulfilled. All he wants is knowledge. Why does he want this knowledge? So that he can approach liberation. In some ways, it's like, a, it, it, you know, it's not pure devotion, but it's not as bad as the other cases. This other people, the other examples of people who came there to Krishna consciousness, they have gross material desires. The jnani, his desire is more subtle. <laughs> he desires liberation. 
He desires, maybe he desires to become one. See? It may simply desire knowledge, not necessarily that he wants liberation. He may simply want knowledge. But it's a, it's a, a little different from somebody who wants money and like that. All right, Would so, could someone read this slide for me, please? I have a question. Yes. My question is about the difference between uh, Jigyasu and the Gyani. Because Jigyasu is also uh, wanting to get spiritual knowledge, and a Gyani is also wanting to get <clears throat> knowledge. Although Gyani wants to approach uh, liberation. So how come Jigyasu is a materialistic and Gyan is not a materialistic? Mm. Although they both want to get knowledge. Mm. Yeah, good question, right? But the Jignasu, you know, his interest is just superficial. You know, he's curious. You know, I'm just trying to understand this, you know. People, they, they often see devotees and, oh, oh I, I see you people all the time, you know. I, I just wonder, what are you doing? What is it you do, you know? They, they just have some curiosity. It's not that they're actually necessarily genuinely interested in the knowledge. But the jnani, he's actually cultivating knowledge. And he actually cultivates this knowledge. So he's on quite a different level from the, the jignasu. The, we could give the example just like, you know, People coming to Krishna consciousness, they can go away after some time. When someone's in distress and he comes to Krishna consciousness, but after the distress is over, then he'll give up Krishna consciousness and go away again. We had one young man one time, we met, some, we met him in the street early in the morning and he was, you know, very disturbed. He said, my girlfriend threw me out. She finished our relationship. She doesn't want anything more to do with me. And so he was very distressed. So we brought him to the temple and we preached to him and we got him in beads and started to get, get him chanting. And so he stayed with us for a few days. But then after a few days, he said, well, I want to go now. And said, I don't feel so bad now. I'll, I'll find another girlfriend. Mm. So, you know, his distress was over, so he thought, give up Krishna consciousness. And similarly, you get people, the arta-arti, people come looking for wealth, and, you know, when sometimes they, they get offered a job. Maybe they have no job, but then somebody say, hey, you know, I, I need somebody to come and work for me. You know, maybe, like, especially in the days of book distribution, when we were out there selling books, the man would say, you know, you should come and work for me. You could sell my goods for me. You could be a good salesman. And so they think, well, well, why should I sell books? I'll make more money working for his company. And so like that, they go, leave Krishna consciousness and they go off and take up some mundane job as a salesman. And then you've got people who are curious and they have a lot of questions. But after some time, they don't, have, they don't come anymore. Why? No more questions. <laughs> no more questions. I, asked, I had so many questions, now I don't have any more questions. So they don't come anymore. In other words, their, their interest was very superficial. But the jnani, he actually, he wants to understand these things. He, he comes to Krishna, not just to, get his questions answered, but to actually under, to develop, to cultivate this knowledge. So he's on the, a, on the much higher platform, Nishkam platform. Understand, Prabhu? Um, my, uh, my answer in this regard, like once a devotee, he was asking different sort of questions to Prabhupada, and then he asked that, Prabhupada, what do you think about Lord Buddha? And Prabhupada said, you only keep asking questions, you don't do anything practical. So that person will come under the category of Jigyasu, who just keep asking questions, get answer of their questions, that they don't do anything practical. 
So is this is the reason that why Jigyasu is below the Gyani category? And that example, will it be coming under the example of Jigyasu? That person was asking question and Popa said, we only ask question when we do nothing better. Yes, right. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, this, this answers me. Thank you very much. Hmm? Okay, but we're going to go ahead. Uh, oh, your microphones are very poor. I can't understand what you say more often, you know. Okay, many leave Krishna consciousness. Baladev Vijabhusan comments that a jignasu is mentioned in the Sanskrit verse between the artha and the art arti, because both will naturally progress to the jignasu category as they advance in Krishna consciousness. If they are not curious about Krishna consciousness, then they are likely to later give up their interest in Krishna's service. Right? So the verse says, Arto Jignasu Artati. So Baladeva Vijavusan relates why the Jignasu is in the middle. He said both of them will naturally come to the Jignasu category as they advance. And he said if they don't become curious about Krishna consciousness, then they're likely to give up their interest in Krishna's service. But just to become curious, that's just the, the very initial stage of Krishna consciousness. It doesn't make them jnanis. The jnani is on a very different level. Hey, just to say, uh, sorry, Maharaj, to disturb you. So, Maharaj, can we say that, uh, I mean, this uh, Artho and Atharthi people, they are under the modes of passion and ignorance, and the Jigyasu are under the mode of uh, goodness. Can we say this thing? Well, no, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't say it quite like that because, you know, you have to understand that there, there will be different categories of people. Some may be in the mode of ignorance, some may be passion, and some may be more inclined towards goodness. Of course, people in distress, people, someone's, in, well, art arti, that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, definitely more passion there, but you all, we also have to consider every individual situation. Some people may be more inclined towards the mode of goodness. We couldn't just categorize them in the, these modes like that. But Manas, from this thing that is on the screen, it appears that Jigyasu is above both Artha and Artati because here it is written ultimately they both might come to the Jigyasu platform. So this yes. thing is, we can say, no? Yes, Jigyasu is above Arto, Artha and Artati. Yes, we agree to that. All right. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, someone read. Association with your devotees. When these four kinds of persons come to the Supreme Lord for devotional service and are completely purified by the association of a pure devotee, they also become pure devotees. As far as the miscreant are concerned, for them devotional service is very difficult because their lives are selfish, irregular, and without spiritual goals. But even some of them, by chance, when they come in contact with a pure devotee, also become pure devotee. Bhagavad Gita, it's from Purpat, Bhagavad Gita 7.16. Thank you very much. Yes, so very nicely explained here. <laughs> the um, association with pure devotee you can work like that. General, if someone gets the association with a pure devotee, they can also become pure devotee. But you get people who are not pious, they're miscreants, and they may get association with pure devotee, they may not take advantage, they're not able to take advantage. But sometimes, some of them, they may, by chance, they may become But uh, when, when Srila Prabhupada would come, just a minute, 
Yeah. When Srila Prabhupada would come to the temple, you know, there would always be so many people. Oh, Prabhupada, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada would go, and all the people would also go, where everybody came from. But somehow they'd come for Prabhupada. They'd take association with Prabhupada, but they didn't take advantage, the real advantage of Prabhupada's association. This is a difficulty. Not everyone's able to take advantage of the association of the pure devotee. And even we see Lord Krishna is on the planet. When Lord Krishna was on the planet, there were only a few people who could actually understand Lord Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You know, you had people like Kamsa's laundry man. <laughs> So, uh, they're not able to understand the position of Lord Krishna. Uh, here we point out the jnanis are higher than the karma mishra bhaktas. Uh, the, those people, karma mishra bhaktas, the people who come maybe like the arto, artarti, the one who's looking for some kind of fruit of result, or the arta. You know, they're karma mishra bhaktas. They have some devotion mixed with karma. So the jnanis are certainly higher than that. From the yoga ladder we know also jnanis above the karma, karma yogi. Above the karma yogi is the jnani. So is there anything wrong in approaching the Lord for some benefit out of devotional service? Anyone like that? Maharaj, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can I ask a question about um, just the previous point? Can you do something about your microphone? Yes, you can ask a question. We're welcome, but please, you know, just try to keep the background Sounds. <laughs> yes. Hare Krishna. Are you there? No. Okay. How about this question? Is there anything wrong in approaching the Lord for some benefit out of devotional service? Is it wrong? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Mataji, please don't. Uh, uh, yes, Maharaj, it is wrong because when we know uh, Krishna can bestow us something better, something more than just uh, artha arti or arti simple things, then we should not approach for uh, menial things, rather we should go for the best thing, prema bhakti. <laughs> yeah, but not everyone's on that level. And we know also, case, you could argue also in Srimad Bhagavatam it says, Akama sarva kamo va moksha kama udharadi tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. That even if one has all material desires or no material, still he should worship the Supreme Lord Krishna. And won't Krishna purify us if we worship him? Yes, Maharaj. So, is there anything wrong in approaching the Lord for some benefit out of devotional service? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we may ask for some benefit, we may not get it, <laughs> right? We may, be, we may come to, for some benefit, but we may not actually get that benefit. <laughs> uh, in the beginning, you know, sometimes like that, we come to Krishna consciousness. People come for different reasons. Come, some people come to Krishna consciousness. They have all different reasons why they're in Krishna consciousness. And so it it it's really up to Krishna. You, uh, I remember a long, some many years ago in the history of our movement. You know, we we were doing different things to raise funds to support the temples. And, and the, over the years, you know, I had taken part in sankir, all different kinds of sankirtan, where we would 
sell different kinds of paraphernalia just to raise funds for supporting the temple. You know, it's not easy to maintain temples. Particularly in the beginning of our movement, uh, we didn't have the congregation which we see nowadays in, in the temples. We see that nowadays we have quite big congregations and congregations are usually all working people and they can help to support the temple. But in the beginning of our movement, we didn't have that kind of facility. And we, we had to raise funds to support the temple ourselves. Actually, I was just reading today and I saw there was an advert that the, the devotees in, in New Mayapur, over in France, they had an, uh, an ad on the, it must have been the internet, the, they said they need 100,000 euros in order to get their, get New Mayapur guest house and everything, get it up to standard that the government want. It's going to cost them 100,000 euros, big money, you know, it's a lot of money. So, where to get it, you know? And they're asking, anybody can help, please contact us. And so, in the past we, we had to raise funds like that, and we would do things like, we would uh, sell, one of the things we were selling were oil paintings. We had paintings, you know, we'd get paintings, and sometimes even get paintings from India, and some other times get paintings from Hong Kong, and we would take a roll of paintings, and we'd go and sell them, and, and this way we'd raise some funds for the temple, for the, to support the temple. But the, the problem is that you, when you start doing these things, sometimes you think, well, well, why should I do this for Krishna? You think, this is so easy, I can make so much money for myself. I don't need to be a devotee, I'll just, you know, I'll just be a, a rich karmi. I can make money, I'm making a lot of money selling these paintings and I can just keep the money for myself. Why should I do... So, this is the problem, that you, if you approach Krishna for some benefit, Krishna will consider, is this actually good for you? Is this going to be good for your Krishna consciousness or not? And of course Krishna, if he thinks this is not going to be good for our Krishna consciousness, Krishna won't sanction it. Can you think of some people who approached Krishna with material desires who became purified? Yes, Maharaj, Guru Maharaj. Okay, yeah, that's the obvious example. Any others? Some people wanted some benefit out of devotional service, you know. We could say that this, <clears throat> of course, this is condemned in Srimad Bhagavatam. This is what uh, Srila Vyasadeva describes as Kaitava Dharma, cheating religion, you worshipping the Lord for some benefit. But at the same time, he does mention, I quoted the verse from the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, where he said, even you have all material desires, still we should worship the Lord. But Maharaj, I was thinking that there is nothing wrong approaching Krishna for some benefit, but it's a great loss for our soul. That he, he can be delivered, uh, not delivered, he can get, he can get Krishna if he practice sincerely and what he's getting, like Dhrumara says, just uh, stones. Mm -hmm. Broken glass. Yes, broken glass. Mm. Yes, but you have to start somewhere, you know, you, you have to start somewhere. Sometimes people would come to our Krishna consciousness movement and they would come because they were attracted by all the attractive young girls who were there. They would see the young girls on Harinam Sankirtan, they would be attracted. Oh, there's so many attractive young girls, I should go there to the temple and meet these young girls. And then other people come and they, they, they see devotees sometimes doing business, you know, doing business, making money. And they think, oh, devotees, you know, they make money. 
And it's all so good, I should be a devotee, I can also make money. And so they come to Krishna consciousness with some material desire, but gradually, gradually get purified. So, is there anything wrong? Well, it's not pure devotion, that's for sure, right? We know that. But you could also say, well, it's a, their beginning of their Krishna consciousness. And gradually they'll get purified, they'll give up their material desires. And they'll realize that the greatest benefit of devotional service is not material, but spiritual. Okay? Any other kind of questions? We can go ahead. Uh, Maharaj, uh, sorry, I could not ask earlier. Uh -huh. uh, just want to ask you a question that in verse number 7.17, .17, we just, uh, you just mentioned that this basically states that jnanis are higher than karma mishrit bhaktas. But uh, when I read this language of this verse, uh, language seems to almost talk about a devotee who is who's pure, who is not contaminated with any jnana. So it says that he's in full knowledge and he's always engaged in pure devotional service. He's the best. So I'm just wondering uh, whether this statement is, is implying to a Gyan Mishrit Bhakta or it is implying to a pure devotee who's uh, devoid of any contamination. Yes, Prabhupada is applying it to devotees. Definitely. Prabhupada is worded the, the the, the sentence in such a way that to apply it to devotee. You see, devotees also have gyan, right? One who is a devotee, he should also have gyan. Yes, yes, much. One who is actually on the topmost level, we know that bhakti yoga, that includes all the lower levels, karma yoga, jnana yoga, jnana yoga, it's all there in the bhakti. Of course, you haven't done the final, oh, you just finished, right? Oh, you finished yoga ladder, so you know this, right? That bhakti yoga includes karma yoga and jnana yoga and dhyana yoga, it's all there within bhakti. So the devotee, he also has this gyan, certainly. And Prabhupada is phrasing it, he's explaining definitely the devotee. But he has this knowledge. Of course, he has to come to that level of devotee. But in the beginning, you know, the knowledge will help to, for him to come to bhakti. If he has got that knowledge, it will be much easier for him to come to take up pure bhakti. If he doesn't have that knowledge, then it will be a, it's not going to be so easy. The knowledge will help, it's a great benefit. It makes it so much obvious to us, the need for bhakti, pure devotion. If we don't have that knowledge, it's not quite the same. So this knowledge is important. We do want to get, that's why within our Krishna Consciousness Movement, we give so much emphasis on regular classes, morning and evening, there'll be classes, people speaking on the scriptures. It's not just only kirtan, but we also have classes. There must always be discussions and presentation of the Krishna Conscious philosophy. And we know how much Prabhupada gave importance to writing his books. And Prabhupada said, the books are for my disciples to read, not just for us to sell. To, because Prabhupada wanted us to get this knowledge, he wanted us to be educated. Because once we get that knowledge, then we'll never give up Krishna consciousness. And we can go on to the level of Kevala Bhakti. Pure bhakti, ananya bhakti. Right? So we do want to come to that level of knowledge. I was giving the example, I was telling you about people going away. When people go away, they, they have distress. When the distress is over, they go away. They have economic problems. When they solve that, they go away. 
And when they're curious and all the, they're not curious anymore, they go away. But if they have that knowledge, if they have this gyan, they'll never give up Krishna consciousness. They'll never go away. One who has actually understood this philosophy will never give up Krishna consciousness. All right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Who would like to read for us? May I, Maharaj? Yes, please. All who comes to the Lord for any purpose is called a Mahatma or great soul. The devotees who want some benefit out of devotional service are accepted by the Lord because there is an exchange of affection. Out of affection, they ask the Lord for some benefit. And when they get it, they become so satisfied that they also advance in devotional service. Hare Krishna. Mm. <laughs> so the devotee wants some benefit, some material benefit out of devotional service. You could say material benefit. They ask the Lord for some material benefit. When they get it, they become so satisfied. They advance in devotional service. So Prabhupada is explaining that even though people have some material desires, they come to the Lord for some material benefit. If they get it, they will become better devotees. They have more faith in Krishna. Hmm. So they're described as Mahatmas, great souls. Uh, Prabhupada explains, he said, two kinds of Mahatmas. There are the renounced Mahatmas and there are the Grihastha Mahatmas. There are also Grihastas in family life. There are also Mahatmas. They're, so long as their focus is on Krishna and devotion to Krishna. If somebody's focus is just on economic development, then he's not Mahatma. But if his focus on Krishna is there, then he's Mahatma. All right, we'll go ahead. Here's this famous verse. Maharaj, yes? Maharaj, just one question. Uh -huh. So, uh, like in Vrindavan, we have uh, many temples like Bhakti Biharuji, where, uh, you know, a lot of people visit there and uh, their main focus is to get something from Krishna, they are asking. And similarly, we have this Balaji Mandir also, where people go and ask something. So, is uh, is this, are these the kind of devotees Krishna is saying here that they are Udhar, they are magnanimous souls? Or it's referring to people who are doing sadhana bhakti yet have some, uh, some sort of material aspirations? Well, if they're doing sadhana bhakti and they have some material desires, they can advance. Now, we do find, you know, that of course there are a lot of people go to temples and they're praying for some material benefit. But generally these people may not so be, be so much engaged in the actual practice of devotional principles. They have some faith, they have some devotion to the Lord. They like to go to temple, they like to see the deity, and they pray to the Lord to give them. Mm -hmm. So, they, you know, they're bringing their material desires. So, it, they may be fortunate because they're going to the temple and they have faith in the Lord. They may get the association with the devotee and they get some association, they hear about Krishna Consciousness. They're instructed to chant, just like we have our ISKCON centers, and people come to the center there, and we get them to chant, and we teach them about the Bhagavad Gita, and we have artis, and we don't just, we don't just ring the bell and beat the gong, we have kirtan, you know, so our whole Krishna Conscious program is to engage people and to educate them in devotional service. These other temples, you know, they just beat the, beat the gong, and ring the bell, and no kirtan. But in a Krishna conscious temple, there's kirtan all the time. And people can join the kirtan, they can hear the chanting, they learn the songs, the Gora Arti songs, they learn these songs. You know, people didn't know these things, but 
because of our ISKCON temples and because of our regular programs, they awaken, they develop that kind of affection, devotion. They were coming in the beginning just for some material, because they had some material needs, but they become attracted and they want to come, they want to keep, keep coming, keep reading. Thank you, thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, just, just one point I'm still not able to uh, feel, I, I just feel that I don't have clarity still. When Krishna says in this text 18 that these all these devotees are undoubtedly unanimous souls, is he referring to to those who like visit temples, may, they may visit Krishna temple seeking some material desire or he's talking about those who visit temples but are also performing devotional services uh, in some sadhana bhakti way so to whom is he referring to that they're all magnanimous souls to just about anyone visiting in the temple and asking for some boon because there's there's a huge amount of population who visits these temples and would just visit to to ask and and their main service will be to go to dham and and uh, and and go with some desires, or maybe just go to thank God for the desires that they have. Well, that Krishna has for. well, take it in context. Remember, Lord Krishna was speaking about four kinds of people who surrender to Him, right? Take it in the context of the Bhagavad Gita. What is Krishna speaking about? He was describing four kinds of people who come and surrender to Him. And then of those, who is the best? You see, all of those that were undoubtedly magnanimous souls. Yeah, but why? Because they've come to Krishna, they've surrendered to Krishna. Even though they've surrendered for some material desire, but they have surrendered. Now, and, and we know also in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, as you surrender to me, I reward you accordingly. So the surrender will vary. So some people, as you say, some people are more, you know, they're, they're just coming to visit and other people are actually engaging in sadhana bhakti. So as they surrender, Krishna rewards them accordingly. But they're all magnanimous souls, yes. But there's different levels of magnanimous souls. <laughs> you know, we, we can't say, you know, just like it says here, Mahatma, great soul. So. There are different kinds of, different levels of Mahatmas, different levels of great souls. All the devotees in the Krishna Consciousness Movement are Mahatmas, but they're all on different levels, you know. Some people are very advanced and others are just beginners. It's not the same. And so when Krishna says they're all magnanimous souls, you have to understand, you know, there's different levels of magnanimous souls. Does that help to make it clearer, Prabhu? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yes, that makes it better. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so going on to text 19, we hear, <laughs> right? Bhakti rarely achieved. Right? Someone like to read? Bahunam Janma Namante Gyanavan Mam Prapadyate Vasudevaha Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudulabaha. After many births and deaths, he who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me, knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is. Such a great soul is very rare. So Mariji, can you explain to me this picture which is on the slide here with this this verse, can you tell me what's going on in this picture? Yes, Maharaj, I, I try. Maharaj, there are so many people are in material world and out of them, few take shelter of Krishna and they reach the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. Yes, but who are these people in the bottom? On the right. Who are looking at Radha and Krishna? Right on the extreme right or left? Down? Well, you can start with the right, yeah. They are the... Uh, Maharaj, as you were saying that we should go with the contest, the four types of people who we are talking about. Mm. Yes. Okay. 
Can you identify them? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Gyan, they are uh, Gyani Maharaj. But in the picture, which ones are there? Who is this? You can see the one man has got the children with them, and the other man yes. is on crutches and bandaged and everything. So? Yes, 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 Maharaj. So, where so, are they? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, bandage is with Artho. Is distressed. His, his disease is distressed, and with the children, uh, the man he must be asking for something. So his art arti, and one who is like this and thinking like he he must be uh, 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 inquisitive, mm. and the one the sage he he can be gyani. Okay, good, yeah. And what about the ones on the left here? They are people who are rotten in this material world, but out of them, these four people come and uh, try it. They come for them, these material things, but ultimately they are tr uh, trying to reach you to the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. <laughs> yeah, the four kinds of people. I don't know if they're trying to reach the lotus feet of Krishna. They're they they're the impious ones. They, they no, don't... no, I'm, I'm, no. Left to left, on left, I'm saying, Maharaj, they are all kind, all people. Out of them, the right hand side, four people come. Out of them. Hmm. Okay. I'm saying yes. Yeah. So on the left, we have the the four impious people, right? Four kinds of impious. Yes, so what do we learn from this verse? Jnana vam mam prapajanti. Uh, that the one one who is actually in knowledge that he will surrender to Krishna. So the goal of knowledge, the goal of knowledge is to surrender to Krishna. But we see from this verse that it's very rare. Samahatma Sutul, it's very rare. And also Bahunam Janmanamante, it takes many births and deaths. <laughs> it's not very quick and it's not very common, not very easy. It takes a long time, a lot of effort. That's the trouble with the path of knowledge. So, uh, we want to go to bhakti directly. We don't want to go through knowledge, just come to knowledge and then, you know, from knowledge then go on to become a pure devotee. It may never happen. <laughs> This takes so long, so many lifetimes. This very life we want to become bhakta, pure, pure devotees. So we don't spend a lot of time cultivating knowledge, but we do need to hear. But the goal of the knowledge, remember, is devotion. To understand Krishna, Vasudev, is everything. Right? Someone would like to read? Simple for the simple. God realization is very easy and at the same time it is very difficult. Easy for those who accept it as truth and difficult for those who are trying to understand by knowledge alone. Since they still have to find their faith after they finish their research work, that may take many, many words. An intelligent man can do it immediately. If one understands that ultimately I will have to surrender to the Supreme Lord and the Supreme Lord is here, personally speaking, Bhagavad Gita. So why not surrender immediately? If ultimately after many, many births, I have to come to this point and surrender, why should I put myself to such difficulties for so many, many births? Why not surrender immediately? If we take up this principle, this intelligence, then God can be realized in one second. But if you don't, then go on with your research work for many, many, many births. Mm -hmm. Lecture of Bhagavad Gita 7.18. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane. Yes. Lecture on seven eighteen. So easy for those who accept it as truth, but difficult for those who are trying to understand by knowledge alone. We, if we take if we take it as just simply knowledge alone, the Prabhupada said that they still have to find their faith after all their research work, after all their knowledge. They still have to cultivate their faith. 
So we want to understand the important point in this process of bhakti. We want to develop faith in the process of bhakti and faith in the association of devotees. So Prabhupada stressed, he said, we, we should be willing to surrender. And Prabhupada said, why not surrender immediately? Why not surrender immediately? Why take so many lifetimes? You take the path of knowledge, many lifetimes, so just surrender immediately. So it's a very nice uh, quote here by Srila Prabhupada, he's making a very important point. Take, take up this principle to surrender to Krishna. Don't just try to do research work for many lifetimes. So from the previous discussion, we know that when one approaches the Lord with desire, his desires get fulfilled. So what happens to those who approach a demigod with desire to become free from their distress? So this is a question for you. We approach the Lord with desire, Krishna fulfills his desires. We get our desires fulfilled. So what if we approach the demigods with desires to get free from our problems? Maharaj, yes. Maharaj, if we get our problem solved by demigods, it may increase and uh, we take many, many more births to go back to our real home, back to Godhead. And uh, one who worship demigods, they are very less intelligent because they would be in the material world only. But we are not a material entity, we are a spiritual entity. And we, we have to go to spiritual sky. But they are approach and they are or they uh, by uh, getting something we get entangled more in the uh, sansara in the cycle of birth and death if we go to demigods and ask something and if we ask the krishna if it's not good for our uh, 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 it's it's not good for our it's not helping us to go back home back to order that krishna will not grant it he's a fa he's like a father yeah, as a tattva, he, if so, but demigods like other relatives or something, if if a child asks for a chocolate, relatives may help them, help that child to give. But Krishna, but a real father knows that the chocolate may spoil the teeth of, of a child, so he will not give. So like this is with the demigods. Oh, all right, so some interesting points, you see. It's like the, the father giving chocolates to his children, was it? This, this example at the end, I was a little puzzled by it. I couldn't follow it exactly, Maharaji. What were you saying? Uh, uh, Maharaj, like uh, if a child asks chocolate from his father, he may give, he may, uh, give the chocolate to his child once, but if he asks daily, so father will not give because father knows that chocolate will, if the if a child eats chocolate on daily basis, a child's teeth may get spoiled. But if you, if some relative will come, relatives are like metaphor is uh, demigods. If, if, if we ask from relatives, from the demigods, they will not think much and they will give without thinking. Of course, they would be like, uh, and um, uh, this, this was Maharaj. And ultimately, whatever we get from the demigod, that will take us in this material world only. And our goal is not to be here. Yeah, you're definitely correct on that part. I agree with that, that the demigods are not going to take us out of the material world. Right? So that's definitely true. So what's the difference if we approach the Lord and we approach the demigods? Now, 
When we approach the Lord, you, he can take us out of the material world, you're saying. The demigods are not... Now what if I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not really approaching the Lord to get out of the material world. I simply, you know, I just want to get free from this distress. I have this distress and I just want to get free of my distress. So can Krishna take away the distress? Maharaj, as we read in the previous verse, Krishna grant us, he will give what is required. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, what if someone surrenders unto me if, uh, and uh, if he needs anything, I will give and whatever he is having, I'll give protection to that. But demigod doesn't do like this. Demigods are like Shiva. Shiva is very uh, Brahma, Shiva or um, Mother Durga. So they are all like whatever we ask, they give without even thinking that that would be good or not. But Krishna, whatever he gives, he gives also and that will take us nearer to him. Well, you, you see, remember the, the, the demigods are much easier to please than Krishna. The demigods, they give things, they, they reciprocate very quickly, as you said. You know, they're much easier to please. You know, isn't it true? You know, the demigods, they can be easily pleased. You know, I don't, and quickly they give results. I think that's why people worship the demigods, because they get the results quickly, but Krishna doesn't give so quick, you know, it takes a long time. Maharaj, it's for our ultimate benefit, that's why, no? That's why. Because like Shiva, Shiva gives a boon to Bhasmasur, and Bhasmasur got, uh, uh, there is one story like this, and whosoever is a uh, 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 follower of demigods, ultimately their end is uh, whatever they give, it's not good. And yes, Krishna gives, he takes long time, but it's uh, for our ultimate good. Sorry, I'm not able to answer exactly. Please forgive. <laughs> well, we hope it's good, but the problem just takes so long. And is it so difficult to worship Krishna and it's so easy to worship demigods? Is that a fact? No, Maharaj. No, Maharaj. Oh, Bhakim, it's Krishna is so very much merciful. Yes, can you, can you explain? Yes, Maharaj. Krishna is so very much merciful that Putna, Putna came to... Uh, Putna came and she wanted to, uh, she, with a very bad intention she came. But Krishna is so very merciful that uh, he gives her uh, the post of Dhatri, a nurse, where in the spiritual world. So who can be more merciful than Krishna? And if you ask any boom from demigod, that will take us definitely to hell. <laughs> if we ask any boon from demigods, I don't know. And if we ask a boon from the demigods, we may ask a boon to take us to heaven. And so, demigods could also arrange to take us to heaven. You know, if we want, we want to go to higher planets, we want to enjoy longer life, demigods could also take us up there to higher planets. We can go to the planets of the demigods, right? You worship the demigods, you go to the planets of the demigods, demigods all live in higher planets. But Maharaj, for devotees, higher planets are like hell. That if we get attracted to Swarga or a higher planet, that we will not be able to go to Goloka. So we have to be focused on Goloka. So ultimately it's not good. Yeah, if, if your focus is Goloka, that's one other thing. But. A lot of people, their focus is not Goloka, their focus is simply the higher planets. And so Krishna fulfills the desire, you go to the higher planets. So there, there is also an arrangement, Maharaj. If you want to enjoy, the, it comes that uh, if you do bhakti for some time even, then after a certain time you can uh, uh, go to higher planet. Then if, if, if there you get the mercy of a pure devotee or a Vaishnava, then from the higher plants also you can be delivered to Goloka. Yes. But we have to understand we may go to higher planets. We can't stay there forever. 
That's the point, right? You go to the higher planets, Brahma, Bhuvana, Loka, all are temporary places of misery. So even we go to the higher planets, we go to these other planets, how long can we stay there? We use up our pious activities and again we come back, come back down. Okay, so you're speaking about Lord Shiva, so here's your Lord Shiva, right? So de dealing with demigods is described here in this section, chapter 7, right? Text number 20 to 23. We're going to hear something about the demigods. Let's see. How should Vaishnavas relate to the demigods? We'd like to, maybe, maybe we should have some group work on this. How many people are here tonight? How many is in the group tonight? Here tonight? 20. 20, Maharaj. 20, okay. So we'll have five groups, right? Five groups of... Yes. Four people? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And you can discuss how should Vaishnavas relate to the demigods and discuss the topic in relation to Prabhupada's instructions, examples of previous acharyas and scriptural evidence. Should I open the breakout rooms, ma'am? Yes, yes, please. Uh, everybody would have gotten an invite to join the breakout room, so please accept that invite.
Jaya Kumari Mataji, since you've just joined, you would have got a request to join a breakout room.
much. Please let me know whenever you want me to close the breakout. I, I think we can close now. Yes. Okay. I, it will take 60 seconds to close. Right. Maraj. Yes. groups have fewer than uh, four devotees because a couple of devotees didn't join their breakout groups. Oh, some really? <laughs> really? <laughs> some groups have two or three uh, participants. Okay. All right. Can we hear from group number number three? Back. Now they're back. Now they're back, yeah? Yes. So group number three? Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Who's the spokesman for the group there? Uh, yes, Maharaj. I, 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 will. Okay. I will try, Maharaj. Okay. Yes. Maharaj, we have taken uh, two, two or three points from each that how should... How, uh, how should Vaishnavas are there to demigods? And the, uh, uh, in the reference of Srila Prabhupada's instruction, we should respect the demigods because they are also devotees of, uh, of Krishna. And Krishna has appointed them. They, uh, Krishna has given them the big, big uh, duties to perform, to run this material world. And they are uh, like Ajiva has, uh, as Krishna has, Krishna, uh, only Krishna has 64 gunas. Lord, uh, Lord Vishnu can have 60 gunas and demigods also have the, uh, big gunas. Like, I, uh, I'm so sorry, it's like 55 gunas. So they are really, uh, we don't need to worship them, but yes, we should respect them. Uh, we, uh, and uh, uh, previous acharyas, uh, Okay, or uh, uh, I want to give evidence from the Shastras, yes, like gopis. Gopis also did the Kaitani Vrata to, uh, for what? For for getting Krishna. And there is one like, more example of Jadvarat Maharaj, uh, Jadvarat. So what uh, they, he is he, a Vaishna, and, uh, but the worshipper of demigods, he took Jad, Jadvar, uh, Jadvarat uh, uh, for... Uh, uh, Maharaj, I'm not getting the word to give his bali, uh, to sacrifice him for the pleasure of uh, uh, Mother Kali. But Kali, uh, the, the, the deity of Kali, she broke down and uh, destroyed all uh, her worshippers and saved Jadvarat. Mm. Like this. Yes, right. Mm. <laughs> Yes, so that's scriptural evidence, right? That's your scriptural yes, evidence. Yes, my Okay, interesting, yes. Uh, you were talking about the devotees, have, the demigods have the qualities. Well, Lord Shiva has 55 qualities. Lord Brahma, in his most perfect stage, will have 50 out of 64 qualities. But not, not every demigod will be on the level of Brahma. Lord Brahma is, you know, he's a very top of the demigods. He's one of the leading demigods. So, so his qualities will be much greater than other demigods. Maharaj, I'm getting one more point. Can I please tell? Okay. Krishna is milk and Lord Shiva is a curd. This is just the difference between uh, Lord... This is just difference between Krishna and uh, Shiva. Uh, Shiva, Lord, uh, 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 it's like uh, it's accepting the uh, and Krishna uh, and Lord Shiva ta takes care of the mode of ignorance. It's a big deal to uh, take this much charge for for the pleasure of Krishna. He is totally devoted to Krishna that uh, he accepted this this job. 
he he became uh, shankracharya he preached material uh, mayavad philosophy for what but because krishna give, gave him instruction to do so so he he took so much dispemi but he did and he uh, so we should really respect them but there is no need to worship them and what we what we can do we can ask them always for their mercy to progress uh, uh, that they may help us to go further in the bhakti okay yes <laughs> we can pray to the demigods to help us to go further in bhakti eh any any ev scriptural evidence of that did anybody do that pray to demigods to go further in bhakti Hare Krishna Maharaj Yes uh, Maharaj uh, in the text uh, number 20 uh, Prabhupada gives the uh, quote from Chaitanya Charitamrita in which it says that uh, Ekla Ishvara Krishna Arsa Bhritya So for a pure devotee of the Lord uh, Krishna is the supreme master so he does not uh, prefers to worship the demigods and uh, uh the pure devotee is actually proper writes here that the pure devotee is satisfied with whatever krishna gives like there is an example that the uh, disease man goes to worship the sun and uh, there are different demigods who somebody who wants education goes to uh, mother saraswati but for a pure devotee they go to krishna only and whatever krishna gives them the devotee is satisfied with that and there is another example in 723 that uh, the worshipper of demigods they don't know that the food where the food should be supplied to the, but the devotees know that the if the belly is satisfied if they provide food to the belly then the entire body gets energy and uh, finally in 722 also propat says that uh, for uh, uh, devotees who desire to return to gemic god uh, material desires are like impediments so they for a pure devotee uh, they only pray for uh, devotional service to krishna and not for, they don't go to demigods for any kind of satisfaction of material desires okay yeah you're very strong on pointing towards devotion can we worship the demigods in relation to krishna Uh, Maharaj, uh, if I may add something on this point. Yes, please. Uh, I think uh, for the with Lord Krishna, uh, Shri Prabhupada usually recommended that we don't get into that territory where you know general masses get confused and they start also worshiping uh, Lord Shiva and and maybe other demigods in the same level as Krishna, but. as far as vaishnavas are concerned uh, vaishnavas do worship i i mean i they they worship demi gods in relation to krishna kat you know these gopis used to worship katyayani to get krishna as a husband uh, i also remember of rupa goswami or sanatan goswami would uh, would um, would pray to shiv uh, to, would do worship of lord shiva i don't know uh, what kind of worship but they would pray to lord shiva and they would worship lord shiva with of course with the idea of uh, seeking seeking uh, you know mercy of lord krishna but uh, i think there are instances of them setting up shivlingas yes. at different sites of vrindavan that's right so, yeah. so so i think it may not be so straight forward and uh, maybe for the for the general audiences one may set an example which ashila prabhupa did he did not celebrate he did not uh, encourage us for he did not arrange us to celebrate mahashivratri but internally uh, vaishnava are very respectful to uh, demigods because they are also servants of lord krishna and as far as lord shiva is concerned there is a special place uh, that i can relate to yes thank you very much for this comments prabhu very nice I agree with Maharaj, that. Maharaj, like, like e even devotees uh, worship uh, Lord Shiva. Like they go to Shivratri, uh, like they go to Shiva temple on Shivratris, and even in Mayapur Parikrama, we go to Hans Bahan Temple, where Lord Shiva came to hear uh, uh, Shiva Bhagavatam when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was dictating. So he took the uh, carrier of Brahma, 
and similarly like lord ganesh is so worshipable people because he he uh, wrote down shrimad bhagavatam for us so like we can pray before re- reading shrimad bhagavatam to lord ganesh also because he he tirelessly uh, wrote shrimad bhagavatam so demigods uh, like generally we see that sometimes we might get into a mode of criticizing the demigods but they are certainly above us uh, like uh, they are certainly above us and they are specially appointed by lord uh, and they are ser- serving the lord and also they are also the limbs of lord like uh, surya is is the chakshu the eyes of lord so similarly all the demigods are different limbs of the lord's body that's right yes so can we worship the demigods like we should respect them we should respect them <laughs> actually we can worship them the, the example was given that bharat maharaj used to worship demigods but he worshiped them as different limbs of the lord he understood they were not the supreme lord but as you were pointing out different demigods represent different limbs of the supreme lord and he would worship the demigods in that way as offering to different limbs of the body of the supreme lord so that's approved you can worship like that and we as you say in mayapur you know lord shiva is shetrapal shiva he's the guardian of the holy dam and before we enter into the holy dam before we go on parikrama it's customary that we will first go to the yoga peeth where shitra pau shiva resides and we should beg permission from lord shiva to enter into the holy dam and it's only but with the blessings of lord shiva that we can actually enter into the holy dam so lord shiva's got the guardian there and we know in vrindavan you have also uh, uh you have uh, what is it mahadev gopeshwar gopeshwar mahadev gopeshwar mahadev right gopeshwar mahadev right lord shiva takes the form of a gopi there and he is a gopeshwar he is a, the the lord of the gopis the controller of the gopis so lord shiva performs many pastimes not only in destruction of course that shiva but there are many other demigods also but as we say they're all different parts of the the body of the lord and we should definitely respect them and the example is there that varad maharaj was worshiping the different limbs of the lord so that was rec- it's recognized that you can do like that although we don't do it personally but uh prabhupad didn't encourage it actually there there was a case they wanted to put lord shiva in the hyderabad temple but prabhupad said if well he put lord shiva here he said people will think it's all the same see prabhupad didn't want everyone to uh, to think oh all the gods are one you go to the mayavadi temple the impersonal te- impersonalist temple you see they have all the gods everyone's there and you don't know which one is actually supreme so that's the idea and of course the impersonalists they're all god they're all one but prabhupad wanted to show very clearly who is actually the supreme lord so though it's mentioned in the nectar of devotion that we should actually worship lord ganesh before entering before having darshan of the deities we should first of all get the blessings of ganesh prabhupad didn't do that he didn't want devotees to get confused and to start thinking all oh, the gods are one Prabhupad was very careful and uh not he it was not in favor of having demigods there in the temple but certainly re- we respect them and Lord Chaitanya also Lord Chaitanya when he was traveling around India he would go and visit all the different temples of the different devas he would go to see them all he didn't think oh this is a vaishnava temple i will only go here no he went to every temple and he would offer respects all right any other points maharaj i have a question uh huh when it comes to the altar in the householders homes uh, so sometimes we assist uh, devotees in setting up the altar and and of course like traditionally they have 
many uh, many you know many uh, elements in the altar such as lord shiva's uh, you know shivling or other other things so in our temples obviously for for the sake of guidance we don't uh, keep any such element any such uh, you know part in our altar but what about what is the guidance for devotees homes are they uh, is it encouraged for us and devotees to keep any words like lord ganesha or uh, maybe lord shiva's shivling in the altar or what should we be teaching on that on that as on, on that side well you know in your own home if you have freedom you can do what you like really it's your home you can decide what particular deities you're going to have and on your altar and everything it, you have that you have that right in your home what we do in the temple for public worship that's a different affair that's uh, well how we're presenting the iskon society now the i do see a number of iskon temples that somehow they they they're having shiva lingas of course as you said we have the shiva linga at rajapur where the jagannath mandir is and they do have they do celebrate maha shivratri there every year because they have a shiva linga and they also have the deity now of simantini Simantini being a form of Mother Durga there, with Lord Chaitanya, and Simantini is getting the blessings from Lord Chaitanya. So those deities are there at uh, Rajapur, and I, some other temples. I, for example, in Dhaka, I heard we have been do, they donated a Shiva temple to us. So it's a Shiva temple, and there's a big Shiva linga there, but we have our own altar. We You know, they give it's a big temple compound, so we have a nice temple for Gorni Thai and everything. Mm -hmm. But the the Shiva worship goes on. Other places I've seen also. I've seen. I was in Malda and Malda also. They have a nice temple, but they have all. They have, Lord Shiva is also there. Shiva Linga there, and Kanai Natsala also. There's a Shiva Linga there. And so. <laughs> I mean, people give us these temples, and the Shiva Linga is already there. We have to keep it; can't move it. Okay. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Are we all right? We we'll go ahead. Okay. Oh. Maharaj, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, like you mentioned that uh, if a devotee wishes to worship, then they can also worship. Uh, like, uh, but you, this is this is only with respect to Lord Shiva, or any other dem demigod. Also, you are mentioning all the demigods are part of the body of the Lord. All of the different limbs of the body of the Lord are they're represented with different demigods. We said the sun, the sun is like the eye of the Lord. Right, and and so other different demigods are also there within the body of the Lord. I'm not exactly. I don't remember all the details which demigods where, but it's definitely mentioned there that all the different demigods are there within the body of the Lord. And Bharat Maharaj was worshiping the different limbs of the Lord through worship of the different demigods. So it's not just Lord Shiva. Okay. But we did mention that Sanatana Goswami, particularly, he was a very devoted to Lord Shiva, and there was a, there is Shiva Linga there, the place where Sanatana was staying there in Braj. Uh -huh. But Maharaj, like uh, like particularly if I talk about Delhi, we are in from mostly mostly all of us are from Delhi. So um, over here there is a, a culture um, uh, outside is gone to worship uh, Demigos Durga, and um, so uh, after coming in association with Iskon, like we have always heard that devotees should make sure that they, in their altar they should not uh, they should do, not have any demigod worship inside the altar. 
apart from Lord Krishna. But if Lord Krishna is present, one should not be worshipping any other demigod in the altar. Like, uh, in, in fact, uh, during the initiation processes, uh, uh, they check the altars also if uh, by chance if somebody has any demigods present inside the altar. And they should not be having it. <laughs> really? Hmm. Interesting. Well, it, it's a question of how we worship the demigods. You see, it's not worship. We certainly we should respect the demigods, and so you ha you may ha happen to have a, a you know one of the devas in your home, and you could you can keep him there, you know. But you, we don't put him on the same level as Lord Krishna. We recognize that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. And the others are demigods, they're on a lower level. So we have to w appreciate them accordingly. I heard uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami, for example, when he was staying over in the UK, you know, he was working on a PhD thesis. And uh, he was, at some point, he was staying there in Oxford. And he also had a Ganesh there in his. Uh, in his in his room or in his uh, somewhere in his in his uh, altar or somewhere, and he was keeping a, a Ganesh there. Hmm, so we, we we have an attraction, we have an appreciation for these different demigods. It, I don't think it's wrong. Maybe wrong in the beginning. That, you know, people like coming from Hindu culture. You see. Uh, then it's maybe a little different because you bring with you your own ideas about the position of the devas or the demigods and and you're not able to quite fully appreciate the supremacy of Lord Krishna. It's a little different for people like us coming from a non-Hindu background and we're coming into the Vaishnav culture. And so we've been worshipping Lord Krishna and we also develop an appreciation for the different devas. Particularly, of course, Lord Shiva is described quite a bit in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's an interesting situation. You have to understand the mood of the spiritual master, what is his particular desire. In Malaysia, Malaysia there's a lot of Tamil people there. So, and South Indian people, they also have to worship the culture of worshipping devas. And so it was difficult for them when Krishna Consciousness Movement first came there. And so they would allow the people to keep the pictures of the demigods and to have a separate altar for Krishna. And that was initially in the beginning, the, 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 they would tell the people, just make a separate altar for Krishna. But then gradually, as they became more devoted, then the Krishna altar would become bigger and more opulent, and they would just, you know, maybe move a, one, of the, one or two of the pictures to the, along into the Krishna altar, something like that. And gradually, they would become fully Krishna conscious, and they, had, they, would, they would lose their interest. In, in the different demigods whom they'd been worshipping. You, you definitely have to be cautious because uh, generally, pe generally people think of all the, go the gods as being one. We don't think of them as being demigods. Even when, the, when they had the article in the Back to Godhead, they, for, some time, for some months they ran a series of articles called the demigods. So there was a criticism from the Hindu Sangam. They said, this is derogatory, this is not proper. These, these are devas, they're not demigods, they're devas. <laughs> they, they didn't like the fact that Prabhupada called the, the different personalities as demigods. And they said, we should use the word devas. <laughs> so, you know, of course, Prabhupada wants to make it clear Demigods, they're not gods, they're demigods. They're not on the position of the Supreme Lord. But 
people like the Hindu Sangam don't always appreciate that. All right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Hindu. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, explain the conclusion found in seven, chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. To eradicate the misconception about demigod worship by referring to the Sanskrit phrases and comments from Srila Prabhupada's purport. Well, I think we've covered that. The misconception about demigod worship. The misconception is all <laughs> you know all the gods are one and the, the, uh, the, they're all gods and uh, you can worship the gods for your material desires no we shouldn't worship the demigods for material desires we should worship krishna it's better even you have material desires worship krishna rather than worship but we offer we do offer our respect to the demigods all right does someone like to read this miss please surrender demigod worshippers and impersonalists verse 20 to 25 those, who, those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desire surrender unto demigods. Bhagavad Gita 7.20 Krishna directs one's faith, Bhagavad Gita 7.21 Ultimately, the results are bestowed by Krishna, Bhagavad Gita 7.22 Less intelligent worshippers, 7.23 mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Alright, so we're just summarizing the main points of the, each of these verses important verses in relation to the worship of the demigods. First of all, first point is that the intelligence is stolen by material desires and that's why they surrender unto demigods. Because we have such strong material desires. And so we, we really want to satisfy these material desires. And we know if we go to Krishna, it may not happen. <laughs> you know, Krishna may take a long time or he may never fulfill our desire, he may take away our desire. <laughs> so people, they go to worship the demigods to, and quickly they get results. And Krishna directs one's faith. And so Krishna's in the heart and he arranges for us to worship which particular kinds of God. Some gods are in the mode of goodness, some are in the mode of passion, and some are in the mode of ignorance. So which particular gods we worship will be determined by our faith. We know things like Kali, Bhairava, and things like that, they're not very pleasant. And then you have the passionate gods for fulfilling your material desires, like Durga and Shiva and Ganesh, but you have also gods in the mode of goodness like Damodar and Krishna, Sita Ram, these things. Of course, they're not just simply in the mode of goodness, they're pure goodness. And in text 22, we should understand that whatever results are given by the demigods is actually due to the grace of Krishna. It's not by the demigods alone. But whatever the demigods do, it has to be sanctioned by Lord Krishna. And then text 23, the less intelligent people. Hmm? Antavat tu palamtesham tad bhavati alpa medasha. Alpa medasha means small intelligence. Why, why is their intelligence small? Can someone say? Why is there intel people who are worshipping demigods, why are they described as alpamedasa? Alp Small intelligence, less intelligence? Because, Maharaj, because they are uh, looking after temporary things. Yes. Limited and temporary. 
And what does Krishna say? Who's getting, whose who's worship is going to bring uh, purified intelligence? Who is worshipping with purified intelligence? In contrast to Alpamedasaha, there's the word Sumedasaha. Have you heard that term before? Sumedasaha? Pure, alp, Alpamedasa is brain, one's brain is very small. And Sumedasa means one's brain is very pure. So who has the pure brain? Yes, Mariji? Who surrenders unto Krishna. You don't know the verse? I'm just forgetting the verse, Maharaj. Yeah. I knew I, I summed this up. Yeah, anybody remember? Anybody remember? Krishna, 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 Krishna. Yes, right. That's the verse. Yes. Where is it from? Srimad Bhagavatam, which canto? Eleventh canto. Who's speaking? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, oh sorry, I'm sorry, Navyogendra. Yes, Wh which, which Navyogendra? And who is he speaking to? Nimi, Maharaj Nimi. Maharaj Nimi, right. Karabhajana Muni is speaking to, to Maharaj Nimi in the eleventh canto describing the avatars in the different ages and he mentions in the Kali Yuga avatar the important verse which is used to identify Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a Yuga avatar. Right? Krishna Varna Tavisha Krishnam Sango Pangastra Parshandam Yegnae Sankirtan Prae Yajanti Hi Sumedasaha People with purified intelligence, they will engage in the chanting of the holy name. So this is important. All right, so verse 23 was about demigods and then it goes on to hear about impersonalism. A little more on demigod worship. Does somebody read? Oh, okay, I'll read. One, one who is honest may be faithful to the government, but he doesn't need to be bribed a government servants. Bribery is illegal. One does not bribe a government servant, but that doesn't mean that one does not show him respect. Similarly, one who engages in the transcendental loving service of the Supreme Lord does not need to worship any demigod, nor does he any tendency to show disrespect to the demigods. It's from purport. 4.2, um, 4.235. Okay, thank you, Mariji. Yes. All right. So, respecting the demigods, not bribing them. <laughs> Demigod worship text 20 to 23, a little bit more about Ganesh. We were hearing about Shiva, now a little bit Ganesh. Con concerning Ganesh worship, it is not actually necessary for us. But, if someone has a sentiment for getting the blessings of Ganesh in order to get large amounts of money for Krishna's service, then it is all right. But anyone who takes up this kind of worship must send me at least $100,000 monthly, not less. If he cannot send this amount, then he cannot do Ganesh worship. <laughs> Letter to Bhaktadas. Bhaktadas Prabhu, the old Prabhupada disciple, he was the president of a temple in uh, Berkeley in California for some time. Hmm. So <laughs> he wanted to worship Ganesh and Prabhupada told him, yeah, Okay, then like this. <laughs> so, Prabhupada had this standards. You want to worship Ganesh? <laughs> okay. You want to make money? Then you give me this money. You can worship. 
All right, someone read text number 24. We'll hear about the impersonalists. Read the verse. Unintelligent men who do not know me perfectly think that I, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, was impersonal before and have now assumed this personality. Due to their small knowledge, they do not know my higher nature, which is imperishable and supreme. Mm, yes. So unintelligent men, they're thinking, I was impersonal before. They're thinking Krishna came from the Brahman. You see, in other words, they're thinking the Brahman is the supreme. And now Krishna has come, he has assumed this form and personality. They do not know, because of their small knowledge, they do not know Krishna's real nature. No. Oh. Yes, you can read. The impersonalists imagine the various demigods to be forms of the Lord. For example, the Mayavadis worship five demigods. Pancho Pashna. They do not actually believe in the form of the Lord, but for the sake of worship, they imagine some form to be God. Generally, they imagine a form of Vishnu, a form of Shiva, and forms of Ganesh, the sun god and Durga. This is called Pancho Pashana. Hmm. All right. So, Mayavadis worshipping, they worship this God. It's probably, actually, they don't believe in the, any forms, but just for the sake of worship, they imagine some form to be God. But they think ultimately nothing has any form. Only one, only the oneness, Brahman, Nirkara, no form. So they imagine these forms. So we ask you to just look through the purport of text 24 and pick out some of the erroneous notions of the impersonalists. The Lord's transcendental form, impersonalism. You have Bhagavad Gita with you, you can just turn to text 24 and pick out some of the erroneous notions of the impersonalists.
Yes, can we get some quotes from you? Here's one. One of the very first, very first comments that uh, you can understand Krishna by discussing Vedanta and Upanishad in other literatures, although it is not possible. Okay. Uh, and, the, it is... and then there is one non-devotee or impersonalist think that Krishna has a body made of this material nature and that all his activities, his form and everything are Maya. Yes, right. That's the one I've got here. These impersonalists are known as Mayavadis. They do not know the ultimate truth, right? So that's one yes, on the... Here's another one. Oh. The monistic contention that ultimate truth is formless and that the form is imposed does not hold true. I mean, they do say that it, it's true. Okay. That God is formless and... Uh, yes, good. They know Krishna to be only the son of Devaki and Vasudeva or a prince or a powerful living entity and not a supreme personality of Godhead. Ah. <laughs> yes. And also, impersonalists argue that the Supreme Personality of Godhead ultimately has no form. Mm -hmm. Okay. Non devoting yes. uh, non devoting impersonalists think that Krishna has a body made of this material nature and that all his activities, his form, and everything are Maya. <laughs> and Lord Krishna also has a planet like other demigods. Yes, they think all the gods are one, right? Okay, very good. So Prabhupada speaking here from a lecture in Bombay about impersonalism. He describes about mudhas. He says, small mudhas are working hard only to become happy. And the big mudha wants to become God. The small mudha wants to become a minister or a president, and the big muda wants to become God. The disease is the same. I shall become the most powerful, but that is not possible. Only Krishna is the most powerful. Jai Srila Prabhupada. Why they cannot see Krishna? 7.25 one cannot challenge the authority of the Supreme and know Him also at the same time. He reserves the right of not being exposed to such a challenging spirit of an insignificant spark of the whole, a spark subjected to the control of illusory energy. From Srimad Bhagavatam 1.2.21 purport. Krishna reserves the right who he shows himself to, right? Not for everyone. So here also 726. Mam tu veda na kaschana. Prabhupada's purport says, in the material world we can see that there is the sun and that there are clouds and different stars and planets. The clouds may cover all these in the sky temporarily. But this covering is only apparent to our limited vision. The sun, the moon and stars are not actually covered. Similarly, Maya cannot cover the Supreme Lord. All right? We think the sun is covered. That's only our tiny vision. Where we are, the clouds are covering. But actually, clouds cannot cover the sun or the moon or the stars. In the same way, Krishna is never covered by Maya. Maya is Krishna's energy. Okay, now here's 728, this important verse here. Often quoted, right, we should understand this verse nicely. Someone chant? Yesham santara pampapam jananam punna karmanam Persons who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life, and whose sinful actions are completely eradicated, are free from the dualities of illusion, and they engage themselves in my service with determination. 
Yeah, when devotees heard this verse, one devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, did I become a devotee because of my pious activities? And Prabhupada laughed. And Prabhupada said, I am creating your piety. <laughs> you understand? So this is explained here, punya karma. Because we're thinking, oh, I must be pious, I've come to Krishna consciousness. So Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains this point. Is this bhagya, this fortune, the result of an accident or something else? In the scriptures, devotional service and pious activity are considered fortunate. Pious activities can be divided into three categories. Pious activities that awaken one's dormant Krishna consciousness are called bhakti unmukhi sukriti. Pious activities that bestow material opulence are called bhagwan mukhi sukriti and pious activities that enable the living entity to merge into the existence of the Supreme are called Mokshon Mukhi Sukriti. These last two awards of pious activities are not actually fortunate. All right, devotees, we're, we're, we're not so, we're not really, con we shouldn't be anyway concerned with getting material opulence are in merging into the impersonal feature of the Supreme. What we want is what awakens our Krishna consciousness. So we want that kind of Sukriti. Pious activities are fortunate when they help one become Krishna conscious. The good fortune of Bhakti Unmukhi is attainable only when one comes in contact with a devotee, by associating with a devotee, willingly or unwillingly, one advances in devotional service, and thus one's dormant Krishna consciousness is awakened. So Prabhupada describes here, the whole world is full of sinful life. We are creating the atmosphere, punya shravana, chanting and hearing, simply by these two processes, punya shravana kirtana, punya pious. So anyone who is coming here, even he does not understand a single word which we are speaking, if he simply hears, he becomes pious. Simply by hearing, even a child, he becomes pious. And unless we are free from our sinful life, we cannot understand about God. Srimad Bhagavatam 1217, 1972. Baladeva Vidya Bhusan says, Baladeva Vidya great Acharya, those who have performed pleasing actions, which gained the mercy of the great souls, worship me. So, if you get the mercy of the great soul, worship Krishna. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, those who have punya karma, who have destroyed sins partially, develop predominance of sattva gun and diminished tamagun. The result of this is a decrease in illusion. Consequently, they become less attached. Then they have a chance of association with my devotees. Then they become completely free of sin by practice of worship. Being freed completely of illusion, they become steady in worshipping me. So, conclusion, above statement concludes that punya karma is not the cause of kevala bhakti. <laughs> Understand? Pure devotion is not caused by pious activities. 
It's not just pious activities which cause pure devotion. What is the cause? Association with the devotee is the cause. So, what did we cover tonight? Examples of people who surrender and don't surrender. Lord Nityananda's mood, a jnani more qualified to begin Krishna Bhakti, if he, think, if he has some knowledge. And then we discussed about Vaishnavas, how we deal with the demigods. Krishna is covered by the internal potency. Krishna is covered by, he doesn't reveal himself to everyone, he's covered by his internal potency. And then finally we spoke about punya karma, prerequisite for practice of Krishna Bhakti. All right, Srila Prabhupada, ki jai. End quote. Someone can read? Many, su Many subjects have been discussed in this chapter. The man in distress, the inquisitive man, the man in want of material necessities, knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of Paramatma, liberation from birth, death and disease, and worship of the Supreme Lord. However, he who is actually elevated in Krishna consciousness does not care for the different processes. He simply directly engages himself in the activities of Krishna consciousness and thereby factually attains his constitutional position as an eternal servant of Lord Krishna. Jai. <laughs> Go ahead, keep reading. In such a situation, he takes pleasure in hearing and glorifying the Supreme Lord in pure devotional service. He is convinced that by his doing so, all, all his objectives will be fulfilled. This determined faith is called Dhridvataha. And this is beginning of Bhakti Yoga or Transcendental Loving Service. It's from Purpose Standpoint 30 Bhagavad Gita. Mm, Right? Right, that word Vridavat, it comes up twice in Bhagavad Gita. We have it here. Yesham Twanta Gatam Papam, Jananam Pun, Te Danva No Mohanir Mukta, Bajantimam, Dridavrat. Right? To take up devotional sense. It's also mentioned, Dridavrat, about Mahatmas. They are also they also have Dridavrat. Okay. That will come up in chapter nine, you'll hear. Okay. So any questions? Maharaj, I, Maharaj, thank you so very much for giving us your time and uh, uh, very humbly answering all the questions and making our, us understand all this thing. Thank you so much. Maharaj, can I please request you, can we have these slides which we are reading? And then these slides are very powerful. Yeah, how do I give you them? What do I do? His guest, Yagyadhanishta Prabhu, he can coordinate like. Okay. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Yes, Maharaj, this slide is very, very, very helpful for me also, so you can get it to me very, very helpful for us. What did Prabhu say? I didn't hear what he said. He, he's saying the same, that uh, we all will get, so we will be benefited. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, 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 you'll get. Okay. Please have my respectful obeisances and to feed my Any questions? Okay, then we'll finish here. I'll see you tomorrow night. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Gorbhakta Vrinda ki. Jai. Hare Krishna.